There's a slight change of the program. So we will be starting the symposium number 13, laparoscopy for the general surgeon. To chair the symposium, let me invite Dr. Kael Fernando and Dr. S.S. Jamil. I think we are on time. Uh, this is the symposium number 13 of our Golden Jubilee annual scientific session. And uh, the topic will be the laparoscopy for the general surgeons. And the first speaker will be Dr. Uday Samarajeeva. And uh, I think he'll be talking about management of chronic post herniography pain. Does laparoscopy approach help? I think he's here at the moment, but he's coming on online. Good morning and welcome to the symposium on laparoscopy for general surgeons. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the, uh, the president of the College of Surgeons of Sri Lanka and also the, the academic subcommittee for giving me this opportunity to talk to you in this special occasion. As you know, we are celebrating the Golden Jubilee of the College of Surgeons in this year. Uh, let me share my screen for the presentation. Yeah. I was asked to talk about the management of chronic post herniography groin pain and does the laparoscopic approach help in this problem. Now, before going into the before going into answering the question whether the laparoscopic approach really helps in this uh, problem, but we, we we need to know about the background. Uh, so let us start with the basics. Definition. The International Association for the Study of Pain in 1986 uh, defines chronic groin pain following herniography as pain lasting more than three months after surgery. A hernia search group a few years later gave another definition, which is more or less the same. Uh, they defined as brothersome moderate pain with impact on daily activities lasting more than three months post-operatively. Uh, the first uh, literature or the first case series on this uh, was reported by Harms and his colleagues in 1984 uh, in, re in relation to the chronic post-operative growing pain. The pain can, uh, can uh, vary from the, depending on the severity, it can vary from mild discomfort in the groin or to a severe pain with, uh, act with limiting the activities of daily living. The incidence of clinically significant pain ranges from 10 to 12 percent. Debilitating pain with impact of normal daily activities can range from 1 to 6 percent. So how big is the problem? Now, unfortunately, we don't have a national hernia registry or a database to gather information. But if you look into the world figures, annually about 20 million inguinal hernia surgeries are performed worldwide. Uh, now, you take U.S. alone, 800,000 inguinal hernia repairs are done in the U.S. per year. And uh, so if you calculate the number of patients with severe pain, that will come up to about 8,000 to 48,000. So that's a big number who needs specialized management in relation to this problem. Now, looking, going, in back to, going back to etiology, so there are basically two processes which can lead to the occurrence of pain, that is the neuropathic component and the nociceptive. The neuropathic component is mainly due to the damage to the regional nerves. In the next uh, few slides, we will look into the, the nerves and their, their, and their degree of and how, how they are damaged. Now, the damage can be due to stretching, crushing, entrapment, or due to diatomy burns, or even it could be following surgery due to entrapment in the meshoma which is a fibro, fibrotic mesh uh, formed around the mesh. Uh, usually the neuropathic pain is uh, stabbing or burning in nature and can be aggravated with movements. The nociceptive pain is due to the slow inflammatory process related to the mesh. As you know, the mesh is a uh, foreign material which, in, which initiates an inflammatory process. And it could be also due to mesh migration or scarring. And this is usually a constant dull ache. Now, what is more important is that 
The differentiation into neuro nociceptive or neuropathic has little clinical significance when it comes to managing a patient. And up to now, there are no studies to distinguish the two types separately, and there is significant overlap between the two components. So that is something which is very important to keep in mind. So what are the nerves involved? Uh, if you look into the first picture, it shows the, the, the percentage of uh, the distribution of the pain. As you can see, a uh, majority of people will come with pain over the scar and also in the groin, and there will be a significant proportion with uh, pain in the external genitalia. And an another minor percentage of pain in the thigh, especially the inner aspect. Now, the nerves involved are, as you know, the, the ileo hypogastric nerve, the ileoinguinal nerve, and the genitofemoral nerve, which divides into two branches, the femoral and the genital branch. And also, you can, there can be sometimes damage to the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. So commonly damaged nerves in open surgery, it's commonly is the ileoinguinal, ileohypogastric, and also the genital branch of the genitofemoral nerve. And in laparoscopic surgery, it could be genitofemoral nerve uh, or even the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. If you look into the risk factors involved, although there have been multiple risk factors in, uh, implicated with the problem, according to Rainport in 2017, there are four risk factors with strong level of evidence, which are female sex, uh, younger age, intense pre op pain, and recurrent surgery. I think these are self explanatory. So, when it comes to evaluating a patient with inguinodynia, it is very important to take a thorough history and do a clinical examination because we need to arrive in a correct diagnosis, ruling out the other possible causes, and also we need to look into whether there is a recurrence in the hernia. Management may need to be individualized considering the following factors. So what are the factors? The original repair technique, subsequent reoperations, character of the vein, presence of recurrence, whether there is a mesoma or not, and also what is a previous fixation technique utilized. So we also use a technique called pain mapping that is to indicate which, that is, that will indicate roughly the, the nerves which are involved. As you can see here, the crosses are the area where there is pain and zeros are the area where there is no problem. So this is uh, this is what we call a pain mapping. So this can be utilized before this before intervention and after intervention to assess the degree of uh, uh, degree of uh, the treatment efficacy. Uh, even the ultrasound scan, CT scan, or even the pelvic MRI may be helpful, especially when there is a mesoma to identify the mesoma. And as you can see in this uh, picture, the arrow indicates a right inguinal hernia repair followed by formation of a mesoma. You can see the uh, fibrotic mass there clearly in the CT scan. So management. Now we have several options depending on the previous factors that I have uh, spoken to you about. So it needs to be individualized and done by people who have experience in managing these uh, problems. And also uh, most of the time it involves a multidisciplinary team with a surgeon, an interventional radiologist, and also sometimes a pain specialist. So watchful waiting with proper explanation about the condition may be helpful in some people with uh, mild pain and can be combined with simple analgesics. And sometimes the simple analgesia is not enough and we may have to go uh, to a, through the next step, which is giving systemic pharmalo pharmacological agents, which may be weak opioids, uh, tricyclic antidepressants, even uh, pregabalins like gabapentinoids. So we can combine these agents to uh, cause a significant pain reduction. The intervention radiologist can help you with injection of local anesthetics and steroids to the, uh, to the nerves to give nerve blocks. And this, can be all, this also can be diagnostic. And when all these pharmacological management, management options fail, then of course we have to uh, turn back to surgery. So what are the surgical options available? One thing is we can remove the mesh and combine with a neurectomy. And if there is a recurrent hernia, recurrent hernia repair can be combined with the neurectomy. And neurectomy can be a selective or triple, that is, 
either cutting down single nerve or cutting all three nerves, which are the iloinguinal, iloapogastric, and the gentofemoral nerve. And this procedure can be done as an open procedure, or it could be done as a laparoscopic procedure. But triple neurectomy is the safest and the mostly recommended procedure. There is a reason behind that because it's sometimes very difficult to diagnose which nerve is actually involved, and sometimes the involvement can be multiple. So in that case, the triple neurectomy will, is the most ideal procedure to be performed. So this diagram again uh, summarizes the, the, the management algorithm, starting from the watchful waiting and referral to a specialized uh, center with expertise, and they can start the systemic uh, analgesia, uh, do the interventions with uh, interventional radiological techniques and followed by surgery. So now recently there has been a very uh, in great in enthusiasm to prevent this problem because one it, once a patient gets a problem, it's going to take a long time and multiple problem, multiple procedures uh, to cure this condition. So prevention has gained a significant interest. So there's reason, there is increased interest among the hernia surgeons who take steps to prevent the problem. So when it comes to prevention, we can talk about prevention in relation to a surgical technique that we use and the type of mesh we use and also the management of nerve during the surgery. So surgical technique, inguinodynia is more frequent in individuals undergoing open repair versus laparoscopic repair. So we'll, we'll see why this occurs. And failure to visualize and protect nerves is one of the main reasons, especially in open technique, why we get this problem in the post-operative period. Lange and Alferi demonstrated that there is less incidence of chronic pain when all three nerves are identified during the surgery. But I mean, I, personally, I don't know how, how much of you actually identify all three nerves during the surgery. Then the other thing is whether to do a prophylactic neurectomy or a pragmatic neurectomy. So what is prophylactic neurectomy? Prophylactic neurectomy is routinely cutting uh, or section in the ileoinguinal nerve uh, during the open procedure. Uh, now, pragmatic neurectomy is to only perform a neurectomy if you suspect whether there, there has been a damage during the surgery. But when you look at the literature, there is no high level of evidence to justify routine prophylactic neurectomy. So that's something to keep in mind. And uh, you can do a pragmatic neurectomy if you really think the nerve uh, is going to come in the, the way of your uh, mesh implantation or if it's really damaged during your mobilization. Comes to the choice of mesh, uh, macroporous polypropylene meshes, which are flat and lightweight are ideal. And they are uh, known to cause less incidence in post-operative hernia pain. Fixation technique in open inguinal hernia repairs, sutures and atraumatic mesh fixation techniques have a comparable risk of growing pain. Whether you use sutures, whether you use atraumatic techniques, there is no very big uh, significant difference in the outcome. And it is more important to avoid damage in nerves during the fixation. That is, I think, more important as, than the technique because if you damage a nerve, there's a high chance of getting post hernia growing pain. And glue fixation is not recommended in L3 and N3 hernias in open repair. So what are these L3 and N3 hernias? It's not a very difficult classification. According to the European Hernial Society classification, N3 and L3 are lateral and medial. That is lateral means indirect, medials mean direct, and three means the hernia is more than two finger pits in size. So these are large hernias and glue fixation is not recommended. I mean, so it's constant. And also in uh, laparoscopic technique, the mesh fixation is recommended in large medial and three hernias. And also atraumatic fixation techniques can be considered, but penetrating fixation should only be used in safe areas. So we will see what are these safe areas. So all these things are important to prevent a person getting a chronic growing pain in the future after a hernia surgery. So now coming back to my question, how does laparoscopy help? So I think I will give you an answer for that. So laparoscopy can help in two ways. But before that, the incidence of growing pain following laparoscopic repair is definitely less than in open surgery. And there is strong evidence from several meta-analyses to approve this factor. 
So acute pain and growing, chronic growing pain are significantly lower in laparoscopic techniques compared to open repairs. So then one should ask why? Now, as a technique, as you know, the laparoscopy itself has a minimal access trauma. And also the nerves during the dissection are all protected by a natural fascial layer. So if you are a good laparoscopic surgeon with a good knowledge in the regional anatomy, and if you do it, your techniques are good, then definitely you can avoid damage to the nerves. And this uh, randomized study also concluded that after even after five years after surgery, only a very small proportion of patients still report moderate to severe chronic pain and laparoscopic inguinal hernia repair leads to less chronic pain than open repair. So this is a, and this is a familiar picture to all of you who are doing laparoscopic hernia surgeries. And this is a typical picture you see in a TAP or transabdominal preperitoneal hernia repair technique. The first one with the peritoneum and the second one, the peritoneum nicely dis dissected off. You can see the blue line indicating, the dark blue line indicating the inguinal ligament. The red indicates the inferior epigastric vessel and the light blue line here. And this triangle is what is called the triangle of pain. And there is a natural fascial layer and underneath you get the nerves. So it is very important to try not to dissect deeper into this plane in this region because in you are the you will mostly like you are most likely to get damage to, damages to the nerve. So after a, a proper dissection, you can see where we are going to lay the mesh in the laparoscopic uh, technique. Now this is the hernia, and you can see we need at least a three to four centimeter overlapping the hernial borders, right? And this is the triangle of pain here. So here. and the vessels here. So this is a nicely laid mesh. As you can see here clearly, the, this is the inguinal ligament, the, the symphysis pubis here, and the, the vessels. And you can see here only two tacks have been applied here. Nothing below this. sit further, you can use a suture here uh, to the corpus ligament because there are no neuronal structures there, but nothing in this region is dangerous. And you can see that the two absorber tacks have been used here. And in this region is dangerous. And you can see that the two absorber tacks have been used here. And I think due to restriction of time, there is, I'm afraid there's no time for any question you can ask, Dr. Uday Samarajiva is here. If somebody has a question, I think you can actually direct the question to him after this. So uh, let me introduce my uh, co-chairperson, Dr. Jamil from Baticolo. He's going to introduce the next speaker. Thank you very much. The, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Rajendra Besekara. He's talking about uh, thoracic laparoscopic isovectomy, a uh, non-tertiary experience. This is over to you, Dr. Rajendra. Hello, I'm Rajendra Besegar. I'm a general surgeon. I worked at one of the base hospitals in the district of Hambad, Dota. I thankfully take this opportunity to share my experience and uh, thoughts about performing Minimal invasive isobagectomy in a center I worked previously. Isobagectomy cancer is the sixth most fatal malignancy in the world. It's the fourth most fatal malignancy according to Sri Lankan statistics. The important thing is if you see the mortality each year, a similar number of cases died due to esophageal cancer. This implies that the world is not being able to get the full control of this fatal disease, despite of having all the new technologies, new method of treating the cancer with multimodal treatment. 
part. This data is from the World Health Organization spreadsheet. The incidence of esophageal cancer is mainly concentrated in Asia. Asian incidence are almost 80% of the incidence are from Asia. The mortality also same. 80% of the mortality due to esophageal cancer is from Asia. If you close, have a close look at of this table, you can see the incidence and the mortality is concentrated around Eastern Asia and the South Central Asia. Mortality also same. This is the age standardized incidence and mortality rate of esophageal cancer. If you see the world average, the incidence stays around 6.3, whereas the incidence in Eastern Asia is 12.3. The mortality rate, rate are also the same. The mortality, the world average stays around 5.6. The mortality in the, this is the list of pioneers the surgeons who did the pioneering work for the development of esophageal cancer operations, starting from Knight Cosmo, who did the first endoscopy, esophagoscopy in 1868. And you can see at the beginning, uh, the latter part of the 19th century, the surgeons were only able to perform the operation on cervical esophagus. It was in 1913, Franz Torek first performed the transthoracic esophagectomy. With the advancement of the modern anesthesia, especially the invent, invent of the double lumen endotracheal intubation and the single lung ventilation techniques, there, it was given a great opportunity for the surgeons to perform more radical operation if you see the 1946 uh, Ivan Lewis popularized the right-sided thoracotomic approach for esophagectomy in 1976 McEwan popularized the technique of tree field esophagectomy in 1978 the Oringa popularized the technique of transhiatal esophagectomy, which is very familiar among most of the surgeons in this part of the world. In 1992, Kosheri did the first thoracoscopic transthoracic esophagectomy. Subsequent to that in 1968, James Lucas from Pittsburgh University did the total minimally invasive esophagectomy. Going back to the surgical resection, surgical resection is the most important and probably the only curative treatment modality for esophageal cancer, except for certain, except for some cases with certain square muscle cancers, when you treat with radiotherapy and modern chemotherapy agent, there is a possibility that cancer might completely disappear, lead into total pathological response. This way, your cancer operation is a complex operation. Due to the unique anatomical location of these vagus, which involve the cervical operation, a thoracic operation, and the abdominal operation to access the esophagus. This combination of access will lead to extensive surgical trauma. This is the reason that esophageal operation had very high morbidity and mortality. Now, however, the thing size changed now. The minimal invasive esophagectomy we can't find a single definition today. The various centers around the world 
use various techniques, various combination of techniques to perform this operation successfully. If you, if we go through these techniques, there is a few common denominators. There are a few common denominators. These are the access mode we utilize to reset these effects and the relevant lymph node clearance. These access modes are open operation, thoracoscopic operation, laparoscopic operation, come, sometimes can be robotic. Open operation is with the two field or three field lymph node dissection considered as the gold standard reference operation for esophageal cancer. MI was open esophagectomy. When you compare MI with open esophagectomy, the main areas we need to consider is whether there is an advantage of perioperative morbidity whether there is an advantage in oncological radicality, whether there is a survival benefit. These are the three areas we have to concentrate when you are comparing MIE versus open spectrum. Minimally invasive spectrum, the first successful large case series published by the James Lukatic and others in 2003 with the excellent results and very low morbidity and mortality. Following this successful publication, this may have given a green light of encouragement and confidence to enthusiastic surgeons all over the world to perform and learn this operation. Subsequent to this publication, there are several randomized trials started to compare many MI technique, MI was open operation. MIRO trial is a such trial, it's a randomized control trial, which was conducted to compare the hybrid technique we are laparoscopic abdominal phase with the combined with the open thoracic phase was compared with the complete open operation. You can see even in that there is a huge difference in the complications, both major complication rate and pulmonary, pulmonary complication rates, which shows a clear evidence that pulmonary and major complications are quite improved after MI. There's an, another trial called time trial. This is a randomized control trial, which was done between 2009 to 2011. It's long-term data analysis shows this trial the MI arms got 59 patients and the open arm got 56 patients. This trial utilized MACUN and Lyvolois esophagectomies as standard esophagectomies. The performing minimally invasive and the open esophagectomy and the open surgery. And the duration of operation, there was no significant difference. And you take the overall period time. However, the thoracic phase has taken more time compared with the open operation, which is statistically significant. The minimal, the blood loss, intraoperative blood loss, there's a significant reduction of intraoperative blood loss with the minimally invasive operation compared with the open operation. Then the morbidity, the pulmonary complications are significantly low in minimally invasive operations compared with the open operation. Anastomotic leaks, there's no difference. Reoperation rate, there's no difference. 30-day mortality, there's no difference detected in this particular study. Then when it comes to the pathological radicality or the oncological acceptance of this MI, the 
R not reception rate is equal in both arms. There's no statistically significant difference. Stage to stage wise, there's again there's no difference. The total number of lymph node harvested was 20, and the open operation was the same. Numbers are same, and there's no statistical difference between two groups. That indicate that the MI is equally sound operation compared with the open esophagectomy which is very important. When it's come to survival, there's, this Kaplan Mears chart shows there's no difference in survival benefit in two groups. It's the same for the disease-free survival as well. Subsequent to this, there were several large-scale meta-analyses were done on the same topic. One such meta analysis was done in, 2000, in 2016, which included 57 studies containing 15,790 cases of resectable esophageal cancer, which is the one of the highest numbered meta analysis, which also shows the same results we discussed, which shows in previous randomized trials. It shows reduction of overall post-operative complications. It shows pulmonary complications are less. Accepting the above evidence, we started doing minimally invasive esophagectomy in district general Hambantota. Our case series include 21 patients who underwent laparoscopic and thoracoscopic macu and esophagectomy starting from May 2017 to May 2021. Our research shows the gender distribution of our cohort was male predominant. 62% of the cases are male. 38% of the cases are female. The mean age of female and male are basically stays around 61 years. Anatomical location of the tumor, the mid esophageal tumor accounts for 23% of the cases. The low esophageal tumor accounts for the 23% of the cases. And the gastroesophageal junctional tumor accounts for 42.42% of the cases. Histologically, the majority, the two-thirds of the cases are squamous cell cancers. The rest of the 33% Rest of the one, rest of the cases are squamous cell cancers, uh, adenocarcinomas. Post-operative outcome: we have four deaths in our case series, and 17% out of 21% recovered. Out of recovered patients, 57% recovered without any having any major complications. 43% person, person develop, seven patients develop complications. The complications are five patients develop post-operative pneumonia, four, three patients had unilateral recurrent nerve palsy, two person, two patients had anastomotic leak from the cervical anastomotic side. The esophageal complication consensus group has Publish the benchmark complication rate associated with the esophagectomy. We plot our, we compare our findings, our results with the benchmarks, overall incidence of complication 59, our values are 43, pneumonia, our values are fairly high compared with the benchmark, and the anastomotic leak is more or less similar to benchmark, and the recurrent laryngeal now. We have a fairly high number and the mean operating time was 210 minutes in our series. The conversion to open operation was zero. The mean number of lymph node harvests were 16. The intraoperative blood loss ranged from 150 to 350 millimeter. The mean post-operative ICU stay was four days. The overall mean hospital stay was 17 days. M, the 
So our surgical approach was right thoracoscopic mobilization of the thoracic esophagus, and then the laparoscopic mobilization of stomach and the abdominal esophagus, upper abdominal mini aperture incision for a specimen retrieval and gastric tube reconstruction. Then we opened the cervical esophagus and the anastomosis is done in the neck. Just want to highlight the lesson we learned during this short series of cases. The, the esophageal cancer is a complex operation which can be done in general surgical setup. I want to emphasize here that general surgical setup is PC setup where you get the electives, other electives, the emergencies, trauma and all, but still the complex of procedure like esophagectomy is can be done successfully in even in the general surgical setup. Organizing the infrastructure, facilities, and equipment and instrument is very important before initiating the process. And one important thing is this equipment and instrument in all these vaginal operations are very expensive and challenging. It's a challenging task to organize these things, especially in the peripheral part of the country training the supportive staff, the junior staff, is an uh, important mandatory requirement. We are doing this in the background of not having any resident trainees. And other important thing is for multimodality treatment or radiotherapy is a, one of the important component that we had to transport some of our patient to where, far away places for radiotherapy because only a very few centers we have in this country to build, provide radiotherapy facilities. The preoperative optimization and nutritional rehabilitation is a very important part in this operation. Most of our patients come after onset for several months after onset of their dysphagia. By the time they present to us, they are having absolute symptoms, absolute dysphagia and they are having already established nutritional failure. Then the next thing is socioeconomic background and myths and misconception around local population. It's very difficult for us to manage because when you give a radio, new adjuvant radiotherapy and chemotherapy, some of these patients get better in terms of symptoms. When they have, when the symptoms go, they might, it's very difficult to convince them to follow up, follow the next step of the management. Long-term follow-up of these patients, the difficult task. Consistency of the team members are very important. It's important the team of the members knows the each and every move, move that you made during the operation to successfully complete the operation. Standardization of the process is the best way to tackle these all these troubles. When it's a procedure is complex, it start structuring the stru restructuring restruct the, the pro when the procedure is complex, standardization is the best way out. I just want to emphasize a few things about the future development, there's a step establishing the correct uh, oncological support and radiotherapy is in the horizon. There's a good news that there's a rearrangement of local referral system to convert into high volume center is important because the esophageal cancer, if you need to get uh, better results, you need to be operating a large number of cases per year. It's a well known fact. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rajendra Obeseker, uh, for your excellent work. We know there's uh, uh, infrastructures and facilities not available as such in the uh, private hospital as uh, Tangola and Hamantota. We really appreciate your work there. Thank you very much. Since we are running short of time, we will uh, move on to the next. Uh, uh, oh, yeah. This topic is research advantage in laparoscopic complicated mental hernia repair. Before that, 
do we have to? Yeah, yeah. Uh, by uh, Mr. Himas Marshuk. This is over to you, Mr. Himas Marshuk. I wish to thank the president and the organizing committee of the College of Surgeons of Sri Lanka for giving me this opportunity to present uh, this talk on avoiding complications in laparoscopic ventral hernia. Ventral hernia is a common condition worldwide. Surgical mesh repair is an accepted procedure universally. In the UK, about 600,000 laparotomies are performed each year, of which 10 to 20 percent of these patients will develop incisional hernias at some point. Even though new techniques and new instruments have been developed over the years to minimize recurrence and risk, no procedure is immune to complications. The rest of my presentation is going to focus on the different stages of the operation and what we, steps we should take to reduce these uh, risks. Um, these will involve the technique the mesh-related uh, complications, and also patient selection. Meticulous um, uh, technique and standard uh, procedure should be uh, maintained to reduce uh, recurrence and complications. This involves adhesiolysis, dealing with the defect, the choice of the mesh and the size of the mesh. We should ensure that the mesh is large enough to overlap uh, the size of the defect. And the uh, plane where we lay the mesh, and the mesh should be taut and flat. There are various uh, fixating devices which we could use to fix this mesh and keep it in place. It is important to perform adhesiolysis and release of adhesions only what is necessary to uh, place the mesh. Any extra adhesiolysis will increase the risk of causing enterotomies and damage. The risk of enterotomy is about 1.5%. It's also important to uh, reduce all the contents of the sac so that uh, the patient will not feel um, a lump and uh, come back with uh, pseudo uh, recurrence. This short video will describe uh, show how uh, adhesiolysis and uh, release of the sac is performed with sharp dissection using scissors. These dissections can be done with scissors or with various energy uh, devices. It is uh, important to keep in mind that uh, there could be bowel hidden within this sac um, in the or within the omentum or the fat and hence dissecting the fat or the omentum should be done meticulously with a high index of suspicion. If not, we could result in making enterotomies. This shows a um, loop of bubble within the uh, defect. This is a patient who had a loop of bubble stuck within um, uh, a hernial defect with very dense fibrous adhesions. And this was a difficult procedure. However, this was perform performed um, with meticulous dissection of the uh, fibrous adhesions even though this was done carefully we uh, discovered an enterotomy in the and this was um, uh, sutured intracorporeally 
Hence, it's very important to have a high index of suspicion. If not, these enterotomies could be easily missed, resulting in um, causing morbidity to the patient. The next uh, um, would be uh, the mesh-related uh, complications. The mesh reacts like a foreign body, causing a fibrous in growth. The strength of the mesh peaks at about 4 to 12 weeks and it incites a chronic inflammatory reaction resulting in adhesions and also uh, giving the tissue the rigidity. But it reduces the elasticity and compliance of the tissue. It can also cause uh, nerve entrapments. This is a patient who had a previous uh, laparoscopic incisional hernia repair with a mesh. You can see parts of the mesh uh, in this um, slide. And the mesh is contracted and fibrosed. And as a result, it has exposed the defect, giving rise to a recurrence. If possible, this mesh should be removed before placing the next mesh. If this is hazardous, then we could place the next mesh over this. But we need to make sure that the next mesh is placed taut and flat. We use a composite mesh for this procedure. The mesh has um, a non-adhesive surface on one side, which needs to come in contact with the bowel. There are different types of uh, meshes available and the type of mesh being used will be dependent on availability and the patient, uh, uh, surgeon preference. The mesh should be laid uh, intra-abdominally with uh, the non-adhesive side facing the bowel. Size of the mesh is uh, important. Uh, the mesh with time will undergo fibrosis and contraction. Therefore, we need to ensure that the mesh is large enough to overlap the defect by at least 4 to 5 centimeters. And uh, once again, it should be taut and it should be flat so that um, it will remain to cover the uh, defect long term and prevent recurrence. It is good practice to mark the uh, defect and also to mark the boundaries of the mesh on the anti-abdominal wall. Um, uh, the blue um, line is the defect size and the red line is uh, the edges of the mesh. And you could clearly see that the, uh, the mesh is overlapping the defect by at least four to five centimeters. And outside the mesh, uh, four blue dots and this is for the suture passer so we pass the suture passer through these dots and grab the mesh with its uh, suture and bring it up to the abdominal wall in a parachute fashion you could see this uh, short video where the suture passer is uh, grabs the uh, suture on the mesh and pulls it up to the anterior abdominal wall. It is very important that the suture passer is outside the mesh so that once uh, the uh, mesh is brought up to the anterior abdominal wall, it will remain taut. There are different fixation methods to keep this mesh in place. Uh, there are permanent uh, and absorbable tacks. They can be fixed with sutures and with glue. There is no clinically significant difference between fixation methods. We use the double crown technique to fix the mesh. What this means is the inner crown uh, is around the hernia defect and the outer crown is along the margin of the mesh 
and this can be uh, one type of uh, fixation device or it can be two different types you would see in this that we have used two different types of fix fixation devices there is a metal fixation for the crown and uh, for inner crown for the outer crown we have used uh, the absorbable fixators and the mesh is taut and mesh is flat it's no closing the defect is known to limit the zero uh, incidence of seroma formation and also it prevents the mesh parachuting in large this uh, video shows uh, closure of the uh, of this moderate uh, sized uh, defect without tension it can be sutured as you see intracorporeally and the intraabdominal pressure should be reduced to about 8 so that uh, this can be approximated with minimum tension and you see at the end the, ten, the, the two ends are approximated with no tension. The incidence of mesh infection is about 1% and these are managed conservatively with antibiotics uh, and collections can be drained and uh, rarely we may have to use uh, removal of part or complete mesh. It's important to tell the patient preoperatively uh, in these cases that they may have a recurrence. Seromas happen uh, in 5 to 12 percent and they are usually managed conservatively and these uh, resolve within three to four months. This is the uh, uh, sac. Um, the sac if possible should be removed to reduce the incidence of seroma however if this cannot be removed uh, it, hazardous to be removed it can be left alone lastly it's important uh, to uh, select the correct patient selecting the wrong patient would result in uh, recurrence complications and increased morbidity we need to be aware of uh, the high risk patients who can develop more recurrence such as obese patients, smokers, malnutrition, patients with connective tissue disorders, patients on steroids, they are high risk patients for recurrence. The defect size is important. The larger defects should be, uh, should have a open a surgery whereas a smaller multiple defects would be suitable for laparoscopic repair. Complex patients may even need an uh, abdominal wall reconstruction. As you see, obese patients with large defects are not suitable for laparoscopic repair. There are limitations in laparoscopic ventral hernia repair. The defect size obviously is very important. And also, if there are significant intraabdominal adhesions with bowel adhesions, these patients should then be uh, converted to an open repair rather than continuing with uh, laparoscopic uh, repair as the incidence of uh, enterotomies and damage is high. Complex ventral hernias should not have um, laparoscopic repair. Therefore, in conclusion, we need to uh, adhere to a standardized uh, meticulous technique. We need also choose the right uh, procedure and the right product for the appropriate patient. Patient selection is extremely important. We should have a high uh, index of suspicion for uh, bowel within the hernia sac to uh, recognize any uh, damage early and to manage this to prevent uh, morbidity. Surgical expertise, of course, is uh, of critical importance. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Marsuk, 
finishing uh, before your time. And uh, we should thank all three uh, speakers taking part in our symposium 13. But this morning, uh, symposium 12, we I think missed the last lecture by uh, Narendra Pinto, that is actually the rehabilitation following trauma. And I think we are going to start that. Thank you, uh, Chairman. Uh, uh, this is a glaring example of what happens to uh, rehabilitation because, I mean, our, this is not a complaint, but uh, th uh, this is an important step which you usually miss. So my, uh, <coughs> uh, my disclosure is that uh, I'm not an expert on uh, rehabilitation, but I'm, uh, re uh, I'm placing you my experience uh, of rehabilitation and the surgeon's point of view. So uh, the, I want to emphasize the components of rehabilitation, team care, the challenges, and the way forward. So, uh, what is uh, rehabilitation? That's the utilization of the existing capacities of the person with disabilities, hitherto PWD, to the maxim, to the optimum level of his or her functional ability by combined and coordinated use of medical and surgical plus social, educational and vocational measures. To, uh, it's a more or less a damage control uh, activity this is to make the person's life more meaningful and productive. And importantly, to, to integrate him back to the society as a differently able person contributing to the society. So, so if you uh, see the statistics, according to WHO, about 2.5, uh, 2.4 billion people are currently living with health conditions that benefit from rehabilitation and this is going to be ever increasing and the people live longer so they have they will have diabetes uh, necessitating amputations and so many other uh, surgical procedure, procedures strokes and cancer are uh, uh, other problems we come across and at the same time which we the uh, already emphasized the injuries the trauma is ever increasing and uh, at uh, uh, much uh, disa disabled persons to the society. <coughs> so the goal of rehabilitation is add life to years, not years to life, because according to the WHO, the health, is, uh, health of human beings is a state of complete physical, mental, social and spiritual well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. So persons with disabilities should be included as part of society. So uh, what's the uh, surgeon's role in rehabilitation? Have we missed uh, some part? Uh, it's a role of trainer, the legal aspect we have, I think some parts are missing, but uh, role of educator, counselor, and so many roles and, uh, on behalf of the, our patients. And uh, the accountability, the patient, accountability is important because once you operate a patient, if you amputate a limb, or if you do a AP resection, you remove his uh, 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 rectum and uh, uh, bowel, then it's your responsibility to make him uh, uh, rehabilitated to bring him back to the society. So the, for this rehab, uh, rehabilitation work, you need a team. The medical team consists of surgeons, rehab physicians and so on, the, and the paramedical team is listed here. 
and how do you make use of the steam? There are three systems of uh, multidisciplinary team and the interdisciplinary team and transdisciplinary team, which I'm going to briefly describe, which is going to be very important. Multidisciplinary team consists of your team members reporting to the uh, attending uh, physician. He is the team leader of the uh, uh, rehabilitation process. But there is no minimal lateral uh, communication between these uh, various subcategories. Therefore, it's not a very good system. And the interdisciplinary system where all the stakeholders are part of the uh, rehabilitation team, including the, uh, including the patient himself. So the communication is better, and uh, this uh, any team member can be a leader. So this diagram will emphasize the activities of this interdisciplinary team. But for that team, you need all the components of the uh, stakeholders. The problem in this part of the world is some members are missing. So therefore, you have to resort to this transdisciplinary team method where there is uh, very much flexibility and uh, closer interdependency of team members. Because if a, uh, uh, say a nurse or occupational therapist is missing, the physiotherapist will take part of the uh, his uh, role. And uh, it's very important, sometimes you can uh, include a family member or uh, any other caregiver to act as an occupational therapist or something after giving him a brief uh, on-site training. So, this is what it means. So, uh, most of the time in our setup and in the develop developing world, this is the method we are uh, implementing. Uh, for rehabilitation, goal setting is important. Setting a, a goal is essential, and this setting a goal uh, if, uh, will vary according to the patient, the family, and the individual uh, back, uh, professionals, and this goal should be smart. That means specific, measurable, achievable, and realistic, and time-dependent. So let's see the challenges we face, the attitude. The problem of the attitude, uh, the negative attitude among even uh, the healthcare pro providers, the patients, family, society, and the government itself. And there is lack of proper system uh, for chain of care for these patients. After the definitive care, uh, you, you can't just discharge the patient, you have to send him to a rehabilitation facility. Uh, uh, according to the needs. And there, is, there should be a monitoring mechanism also. So uh, official red tape and bureaucracy, lack of uh, co uh, collaboration between uh, the Ministry of Health and the Social Services uh, uh, Ministry and so on, these are the challenges uh, we face. So what's your, our way forward? The way forward is we have to uh, play our, 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 our advocacy is important and uh, we have to uh, make every effort to provide this uh, rehabilitation facility to these persons with uh, uh, disabilities and you have to think of innovative me uh, measures, out of the bo box measures uh, to suit the uh, occasion. And uh, it's very important to emphasize to uh, emphasize that you convert this charity-based uh, organization to a right-based care for these patients. And uh, in this regard, I just want to mention that the Sri Lanka Spinal Cord Network, which includes all the stakeholders in uh, disability care, that means administrators, uh, surgeons, physicians, nurses, therapists, volunteers, NGOs and so so many people under one roof and we uh, with the concept of to, uh, total care providing all the uh, 
missing links uh, to these uh, needy patients, and we have collaborated with Asian Spinal Cord Network, International Spinal Cord Society, Sark Surgical Care Society, and the College of now with the College of Surgeons of Sri Lanka. And with the strength of this organization, we look forward to a better future for these persons with disabilities. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Pinto. Uh, may I take this opportunity to apologize profuse, profusely on behalf of the academic uh, uh, committee, what happened uh, during the morning session. That comes to the uh, conclusion of morning, both symposium 12 and 13, and I think we all can go for lunch. Is there a lunch break? Thank you very much, Dr. K. L. Fernando and uh, Dr. Um, Another Dr. Um, and we move on to the plenary lecture number 15, right. communication with the patients and family and the general public during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, may I now call upon uh, uh, Professor Bhavanta Gamage and uh, Dr. Mihira Bandara to uh, chair the session. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is uh, pre-lunch session. Uh, our speaker need no introduction to most of the surgical fraternity of Sri Lanka. Uh, he is none other than Professor Mike Griffins, President of the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh. He is a consultant esophagogastric surgeon uh, at the Royal Victoria Infirmary and he has been to Sri Lanka many times, and uh, uh, he has delivered uh, lectures on this subject, on, on his uh, subject of speciality. This time, in this uh, Golden Jubilee uh, Congress, he's going to talk us about uh, a different topic. Uh, the topic for today's plenary is communication with patients and family and the general public during the COVID-19 pandemic, which I think is really a relevant topic today. Over to you, uh, Prof. Griffin. Well, hello, and thank you so much uh, to the College of Surgeons of Sri Lanka for inviting me to speak to you today. My name is Professor Michael Griffin. I'm president of the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh, and um, I'm going to talk to you today about um, how we talked to our patients in the NHS and how we talked to the general public during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, it is your golden jubilee and I am absolutely delighted to be um, at least taking part in your celebrations, if not uh, face to face. Um, we in the United Kingdom have suffered significantly, as many other countries in the world have, um, from the COVID pandemic. And I wanted to share with you what our experiences were and what perhaps we've learned and um, what has been um, well done and what perhaps has been less well done. Now, I make no apologies for showing this slide. Um, I have talked about communications to cancer patients, something about which I'm very passionate. And um, I've talked a lot about it and taught much about that communication process and how important it is. And that communication process during the pandemic was a real challenge. But I think that the, the points made in this slide are relevant even about uh, talking to patients who have COVID. And that is, do not promise to your patients what you cannot deliver. And furthermore, particularly for cancer patients, don't as a surgeon promise what your colleagues, i.e. the oncologists, cannot deliver either. Very important. Always you have to be consistent and you have to tell the truth, whether it to be patients or the families or whatever. And at all times you have to be friendly and approachable and never patronise. And remember that when patients are under stress and, and very difficult challenging times, there are no daft questions that they can ask you. So you must be ready uh, with the answers. 
Now, when you talk to patients about something as, um, as awful as a cancer diagnosis or in the recent pandemic, the, those patients suffering from COVID-19, the key thing is to get the balance between the reality of the diagnosis and the expectation of treatment and the relative optimism that you can give in terms of prognosis. It is a balance and being optimistic is so important, it's infectious, but it can give false expectation. An openness and honesty should be central to the actions of all who provide healthcare. And it should be at the heart of every relationship between those providing health care and those receiving treatment and care. And trust is absolutely key to this. And doing the right thing is what leadership is all about. And telling the truth is part of it. You have to maintain trust with your patient and the family. You have to demonstrate care and empathy. And if you have made an error or things haven't gone quite according to plan, you must admit your mistakes and explain them. And I want to introduce you to a concept of duty of candour. And the duty of candour came out of the Francis report um, in the United Kingdom, um, initiated by UK government on the um, poor standards of care that occurred in mid Staffordshire hospitals. And the focus of the duty of candour legislation that followed that report was to ensure that organisations told those affected um, that an unintended or unexpected con incident or consequence had occurred to apologise and uh, involve those that were involved in it in meetings to explain what happened. And it has now been enshrined in law in the United Kingdom since November 2014. The duty of candour is absolutely key now in, um, in the National Health Service. So just to go through what happened in the UK uh, with COVID-19 and up until the last few weeks um, we had had over 8 million cases proven of COVID-19. We've had nearly 140,000 deaths and that's for our population of 67 million. And just the other day, the day before yesterday, we had over 40,000 new cases diagnosed. And what did happen? What actually happened um, once the uh, COVID pandemic started? Well, there was um, a cessation of all elective surgery because there was the worry that there wouldn't be enough beds for patients uh, actively ill with COVID-19 uh, in the NHS. Uh, we also ceased all routine diagnostic investigations during that first wave. And there was a reduction overall of nearly 85% of all planned cancer operations. So as a result of COVID-19, there were no COVID-free hospitals um, uh, because all the hot and heavy hospitals that provided cancer care were also admitting um, acutely unwell patients with COVID-19. Um, there were no routine COVID tests for healthcare workers in that first wave, and there was inadequate um, personal protective equipment as well. And as a result, there were many NHS workers succumbed to the disease. There was a lot of nosocomial infection in hospitals and actually the second surge, which happened towards the end of the year um, of 2020, um, was actually worse with over 60, 70,000 infections a day. And the third surge, which we have seen more recently, uh, the figures have gone up to about 50,000 a year. So what about the timelines? There were key dates here in the UK. First of all, it was diagnosed um, in two Chinese nationals that visited York from Wuhan province uh, on January the 31st. And we, they were, it was attempted to get the health contacts of uh, these two individuals, but there was no quarantine and no testing of individuals at that stage. And the reassurance that was given was that the mortality rate from COVID-19 was going to be very low. 
Um, the real super spreading event that occurred in the United Kingdom was a UK citizen who flew from Singapore, um, where he contracted the disease, to the ski to go skiing in the uh, Alps, um, and he spent a week there for. Um, uh, a, a break before coming back to Brighton on February the 6th. And it was clear from around that Brighton area there was a lot of infections developed. And the first death from COVID happened on February the 28th, 2020. Now, on March the 10th, there was a very famous horse racing um, uh, event at Cheltenham Racecourse. And this results in a lot of um, people from, from Ireland coming over to Cheltenham for the uh, course of a few days. And there was over a quarter of a million people attended the Cheltenham Festival. And the following day, uh, March the 11th, uh, Liverpool played Atletico Madrid uh, at Anfield in Liverpool and there was over 52,000 uh, at that game and Madrid at that point on March the 11th was the centre of the European uh, Covid pandemic. It had very high numbers of um, infections and as you can see in the graph um, this was all around that March, April time, um, which uh, saw this huge surge in infections. The government response at this stage was to focus on NHS capacity to make sure that there were beds available for the, uh, the patients um, who were coming in, which was why cancer surgery and elective surgery was paused. And the idea was to try and delay the peak of the epidemic and to push back that uh, peak until the summer months when it would be less devastating to the po uh, population of the UK. Um, there was emphasis on social distancing, um, isolating the vulnerable and reconfiguring the NHS services. But it culminated on March the 23rd in a formal lockdown. Um, uh, what happened was that that stayed in place for nearly a couple of months. There was a gradual release of lockdown on May the 10th and then again in June and July when pubs and restaurants and hairdressers reopened. Um, there was a reinstatement of regional lockdowns in October because of the second surge and a, na a national lockdown in November of 2020 uh, through until um, the spring. On February the 3rd, the Prime Minister of the UK um, uh, spoke to us. And when there is a risk that new diseases such as coronavirus will trigger a panic and a desire for, for market segregation that go beyond what is medically rational to the point of doing real and unnecessary economic damage, then, at that moment, Humanity needs some government somewhere that is willing at least to make the case powerfully for freedom of exchange. Some country ready to take off its Clark Kent spectacles and leap into the phone booth and emerge with its cloak flowing as the supercharged champion of the right of populations of the earth to buy and sell freely among each other. And here in Greenwich in the first week of February 2020, I can tell you, in all humility, that the UK is ready for that role. So he, the Prime Minister was saying that COVID shouldn't affect um, the economy. However, uh, it became clear during that first um, week in March that um, infections were rising, and um, the, but the government felt that things were under control. And the Health Secretary, Matt Hancock, spoke in the, uh, the House of Parliament. And we were reassured as doctors um, and as members of the public that we were well prepared. The public can be assured that the whole of the UK is always well prepared for these types of outbreaks and we'll remain vigilant and keep our response under constant review in the light of emerging scientific evidence. So the following day, um, we were... Um, Having been told that we were well prepared, the Prime Minister spoke um, from Downing Street 
to the general public. Uh, a COBRA meeting on coronavirus. And I think it's very important to stress that this is a uh, problem that I think is likely to become more significant for this country in the course of the next days and, and weeks. And uh, therefore that we've been making every possible preparation for that. And this country is very, very well prepared. So um, he, like Matt, Matt Hancock, felt that we were well prepared. Um, the next I, 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 day, I, I, he spoke again. Continues. But I, 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 I'm shaking hands. Continues. I was at a, I was at a hospital the other night where I think there were a few, there were actually a few coronavirus uh, patients, and I shook hands with everybody. Uh, you'll be pleased to know, and, and I continue to shake hands. And uh, uh, I think it's very important that we, you know, people obviously can make up their own minds. I think that Matt has said that people must make up their own minds, but I think the scientific evidence is well. I'll hand over to the to, to the experts, but, but our hands. judgment, our judgment is wash. Uh, washing your hands is the crucial thing. So the Prime Minister was shaking hands, uh, going around hospitals at this time, and felt that that was appropriate. Um, this month of March was, and April resulted in huge increases in infections, as you can see with the graph on the left-hand side. And this was a huge challenge for the NHS and a huge challenge to those that worked in the NHS. Um, and in particular, talking to patients who had COVID and talking to their families was a challenge because you had to communicate with patients wearing very extensive personal protective equipment, as you can see, um, masks, visors. You had to put your name on your headgear so that the patient knew who they were talking, who was talking to them. And you had to be very clear in what you said. I mean, you could think about, are you making con eye contact? You could almost uh, use your body language to communicate as well. But it was a hugely challenging time. And not being able to hug, hold hands, um, and, and really use your facial expressions to, to demonstrate care and consideration and compassion was extremely difficult. And indeed, we had to almost reinvent ourselves as to how we, we, we talk to patients. It wasn't as e easy and straightforward as talking to patients in a normal environment or even talking to cancer patients during um, uh, normal practice. Um, you, had to, you had to work out whether the patient was ready to talk and, you know, can we talk about your care? Because often that care perhaps was coming at the end of a life. Were the family ready to talk about um, these difficult, difficult times? Is everybody who wanted to be there, there? And of course, many could not be there because we were not allowing uh, um, families to come into hospital because of the risk of hospital acquired infections. And so we had to have innovative ways of communicating with the family. Um, and again, manage the expectations. You had to say to patients, what do you know so far and what do you want to ask? Explain what we, we knew and what we know and what, um, and what we didn't know. And there was a lot that we didn't know about this disease. And we ha the most important thing was that we had to be open and honest about that. And we had to find out what actually mattered to them as a, f as, as a family but as a patient and make sure that the language that we used was simple and straightforward and that we were there to help. And also, at the end of all that, make a plan as to so that the family and the patient knew where we were going. So it really was a challenge to talk to family in hospitals and what we had to do was to use mobile phones, we had to use iPads, tablets to be able to communicate perhaps with FaceTime and so on. And this allowed uh, us and the patient to communicate with, um, with family. And intensive care units had restricted uh, bas basically all patient visits during the pandemic uh, to limit the transmission of the virus. And um, the tips on communicating with patients and their loved ones during the lockdown were given by our staff, our hardworking staff, uh, and trying to, to provide that emotional support, often at the end of life.
There was a lot of concern during this time expressed from uh, our ITU staff, high dependency staff, all uh, staff who were working on COVID uh, hot wards. And there were many exp um, expressions of anxiety um, uh, that came out. I'm a nurse in a COVID-19 unit. My leaders frightened me more than the virus was one comment. It's out of our hands. We don't have uh, enough personal protective equipment. Everyone is out of their comfort zone. We, we hear your concerns, but there's nothing we can do. There, were, there was a lot of, of loss of trust and confidence. Um, and, and there was a feeling that, they, that, that our staff were actually failing their pa patients during this time. A very, very difficult time to work. And we were told um, by the Secretary of State for Health that um, there was adequate pro, uh, personal protective well, equipment. Uh, well, uh, as I said just now, there were, there were areas where it was enormously challenging um, and there were areas where there were problems, but we never had a national outage of it. We were very close to that, but we didn't have a national outage of what short do you mean of by What do you mean by... So um, we were told that there was not an outage of personal protective equipment and yet there were countless... Um, episodes of, for instance, pay, uh, nurses, doctors using bin liners instead of aprons. Um, though it was a very challenging time. Um, and uh, soon after this, on March the 20th, the uh, Prime Minister addressed uh, the general public in the Downing Street press conference. I wanted to try to say something today about how I see the timescale of this campaign and and where we're going and, and what we we need to do and i do think looking at it all that we can turn the tide within the next 12 weeks so no one um including the government and no one in the gen general population uh, could have envisaged how covid had um uh, had spread and what effect it would have had and no one including the government was to blame for that um, however it was important that messages got over to the general public about how to behave and how to minimize um, transmission so um, on may the 10th and you can see the the uh, the number of cases that were uh, occurring on may may the 10th and at the top top and the left hand corner of the graph uh, so figures were pretty high and the prime minister uh, decided to uh, address the general public on a Sunday evening. This week, we said that you should work from home if you can and only go to work if you must. We now need to stress that anyone who can't work from home, for instance, those in construction or manufacturing, should be actively encouraged to go to work and we want it to be safe for you to get to work. So you should avoid public transport if at all possible because we must and will maintain social distancing and capacity will therefore be limited so the message was very confused on that sunday evening it caused a lot of of um uh, un uncertainty in the general public because there were he was on the one stage saying go to work but couldn't use public transport. This was a challenge for the public to understand what they should do. And indeed, it was so much confusion that the following day, um, a, a well-known comedian did a parody of the Prime Minister. So we are saying, don't go to work, go to work. Don't take public transport, go to work, don't go to work. Stay indoors. If you can work from home, go to work. Don't go to work. Go outside, don't go outside. And, uh, and then we will or won't uh, do something or other. So there was a lot of unhappiness during that time um, because the messages were confusing. And there was a huge challenge to those uh, uh, loved ones that were in care homes. And care homes had been largely forgotten about. The patients were sent home from hospitals into care homes without testing, uh, having 
recovered from COVID, some who had not been diagnosed with COVID and who went back and who had COVID. And so there was a huge rise in nosocomial infections throughout the care home system. And this resulted in a huge number of deaths. Over, now, over 40,000 um, people succumbed in care homes in the United Kingdom. And uh, this was a very distressing time, particularly because families were not able to visit those who actually were dying in the care homes. And um, that weekend, when the, um, it was at its highest number of mortalities, um, the Prime Minister spoke uh, on national news. Social care, I think there's been, there was, it, we discovered uh, too many care homes uh, didn't really follow the procedures in the way that they, they could have, but we're learning less. So it was suggested that the care homes weren't um, adhering to procedures and protocols. The problem was that patients were being sent home from hospitals with COVID and into care homes, and there was virtually uh, no personal protective equipment. And this was a really difficult time. And for those looking after and caring for uh, patients in care homes, it was deeply, deeply distressing. Back in 2003, another coronavirus had hit Hong Kong. It was called the SARS epidemic. And um, Hong Kong dealt with this. Incre it was a distressing time for Hong Kong. But actually, um, overall, during this outbreak, which lasted three to four months, um, the, there were about 700 deaths in Hong Kong. Um, what they did immediately was quarantine. They controlled borders to stop people going out and coming in. They contact traced, they surveyed, they insisted on isolation of anyone suffering from uh, SARS, and they absolutely adhered to social distancing um, in hospitals. Uh, the, the picture on the top shows that people were facing one way. If they were in uh, canteens, they would face one way, everybody facing the same way, so that, that nobody facing each other, so that um, nosocomial infections were minimised. Face coverings were mandatory, and actually they closed down schools. And they got control very quickly, within three months, and the, uh, what could have been an absolutely catastrophic uh, epidemic uh, was minimised. And did we learn from this? And did the world learn from this? Possibly not. Um, so on July the 3rd, um, greatly ad uh, advertised test and trace programme was, um, was talked about by the Prime Minister. Scaled up testing at a local level combined with contract taste, contact tasting, testing, tracing, forgive me, contract, contract, contact tracing. So uh, once again, perhaps not the clearest of messages about test and trace, and sadly, the test and trace whole system uh, failed really to uh, make any impact on the, uh, on the progress of the pandemic. There was then a scheme during August um, called Eat Out to Help Out. This was um, a scheme that actually resulted in COVID-19 infections increasing from 8 to 17%. Um, and this was a govern government initiative which cost about £500 million. And it was, it was brought about in order to restart uh, restaurants and hospitality and to try and kickstart um, the, that part of the industry. Um, and our Chancellor, Rishi Sunak, uh, spoke to, to the Houses of Parliament. I can announce today that for the month of August, we will give everyone in the country an Eat Out to Help Out discount. Meals eaten at any participating business, Monday to Wednesday, will be 50% off, up to a maximum discount of £10 per head for everyone, including children. So this was encouraging people to get out and to mix. And uh, as I said at the start, um, this resulted in a further increase in, um, uh, in, in infections. And the summer release of lockdown um, resulted in very crowded beaches um, and um, 
a further surge uh, was anticipated. And the, uh, despite pretty um, extensive mixing, uh, particularly in the south of England, um, the Prime Minister, the Health Secretary spoke again uh, on national television. The vast majority of people yesterday were social distancing and we're trying to bring back you know, the things that make life worth living uh, and at the same time keep people safe. So people should enjoy summer safely, both with the emphasis on enjoy but also on, on safely. And thus far from what I've seen, of course there are individual incidents um, and, but people really should follow the social distancing rules and that's what the vast majority of people were doing yesterday. And the difficulty there was that the vast majority of people were not doing that uh, because they hadn't been instructed to. Um, so it was a very, again another difficult time. We got through the, um, the autumn um, uh, with a, a decrease in the number of cases um, but then as we went into November cases started to rise again and this was the real second wave of the pandemic. And um, on November the 5th, the, at the Downing Street uh, press conference, the Prime Minister spoke uh, to the nation. I have a, a, a every confidence that we will be able, if we follow this package of measures uh, in the way that we can, uh, and as we have done before, uh, Romilly, uh, I've no doubt that uh, people will be able to have as normal a Christmas as possible and that we'll be able to get things open uh, before Christmas as well. So a normal Christmas, the idea was to have five days of normality at Christmas. That was what the government had intended. Um, and yet um, this was on the rising curve of infections. And of course, uh, that rise continued um, exponentially over the coming weeks. And um, on December the 18th, he we spoke must, again. I'm afraid, we must, I'm afraid, look again at Christmas. And as Prime Minister, it's my duty to take difficult decisions to do what is right to protect the people of this country. Given the early evidence we have on this new variant of the virus, the potential risk it poses, uh, it is with a very heavy heart, I must tell you, we cannot continue with Christmas as planned. So Christmas was reduced to one day, uh, which um, many um, in the medical fraternity felt was one day too much um, because we recognised that this would result in further surges of infections. Um, the vaccination rollout then came towards uh, the middle of December um, and over 50 million first doses were given in within the first few months um, and it was a really successful um, rollout and congratulations to the NHS workers who rolled that out and to uh, government for um, investing in the companies to um, to actually be pr produce successful vaccines. So this really was um, uh, the hope that this would be the end of the COVID pandemic. Cases were still high at this stage, but it was a positive, positive message uh, for everybody to hear. But I need to emphasize that this presentation is not at all political in any shape. It's about communication and it is how that communication is achieved and how it is delivered. And it's not just the United Kingdom who failed to be clear and straight in their communications and messages. Uh, this action, um, clearly motivated, motivated by other reasons, has and will continue, and has continued to cost lives throughout mainland Europe. There is no scientific, there was no scientific foundation to uh, what was uh, done and it cost lives. The decision which has been taken in accordance with our European policy is to suspend the AstraZeneca vaccine as a precautionary measure with hopes of resuming distribution as soon as the European Medicines Agency allows it. We are led here by a simple guide, informed by science and the relevant authorities, also doing so within the framework of a European strategy. So the French government uh, stopped the vaccine rollout. So how should we 
have talked and how should we talk to the public during this? Well, um, I think this uh, uh, information that was sent out to families about talking to children about COVID-19 actually sums up. You have to be honest. You have to be open and honest. You have to be calm. You have to be brave and strong and you have to be balanced in how you deliver that message. And I think that a good example of how that message was given over was uh, shown by the New Zealand Prime Minister, Jacinda um, uh, Ardern. I'm speaking directly to all New Zealanders today to give you as much certainty and clarity as we can as we fight COVID-19. Over the past few weeks, the world has changed and it has changed very quickly. In February, it would have seemed unimaginable to close New Zealand's borders to the world. And now it has been an obvious step as we fight COVID-19. So border closures and a strict lockdown in March got rid of the disease and New Zealand went 102 days without a single case. Um, then in, the, the, in August, there was an outbreak again in Auckland, but these were really small numbers. Um, it's a different population, different demography, uh, but it was certainly a different message from leadership. And um, she went on. For now, I ask that New Zealand does what we do so well. We are a country that is creative, practical and community minded. We may not have experienced anything like this in our lifetimes, but we know how to rally and we know how to look after one another. And right now, what could be more important than that? So thank you for all that you're about to do. Please be strong, be kind, and unite against COVID-19. So her message was be strong and be kind to each other and to stick to the rules. Uh, and those rules were very rigorously stuck to by the general population in New Zealand. And of course, the number of uh, deaths there are still in the tens not in the hundreds, thousands. So to summary, to summarise, <laughs> talking to everyone during this pandemic, you do have to try and get it right first time, but nobody will. It is, it is a very difficult situation dealing with a new virus and not knowing how it would spread or what the mortality would be. Uh, but you still have to demonstrate care and compassion and empathy, understanding and be open and honest. You have to admit your mistakes and the duty of candour comes back that was enshrined in our law in 2014 to say admit mistakes have been made and be honest about them. Above all, tell the truth. And I would say to you, Perhaps, as our NHS workers and our doctors and nurses are bound by that duty of candour, I would like to see politicians be bound by a duty of candour going forward. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Prof. Mike Griffin, for your very interesting uh, talk on the communication with the patients and family during the pandemic. We all know that it's a real challenge uh, during the pandemic is talking to this, uh, the public and the, the patients. But it's, you highlighted that the, we have to stick to the basics, being uh, truthful and honest and empathetic. Thank you once again on behalf of the College of Surgeons. We'll be continuing the sessions. Uh, and uh, I w may I ask uh, uh, Hillary to continue. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Bhavantagamage and Dr. Mihira Bandara. Um, the lunch is served outside, but we'll be continuing the academic program uh, as we have planned. So um, we are into symposium number 15, surgical management of esophageal carcinoma. I have the pleasure of inviting the chairperson sirs for the session, Dr. Kanishka De Silva and Dr. Jayamal Ari Ratna. Uh, Please uh, come to the stage, sir. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, this is a very interesting uh, uh, section of the sessions because this is a very important cancer in Sri Lanka, uh, the esophageal carcinoma, which is a, 
actually accounts for uh, about 8% of cancers in Sri Lanka. And uh, it creates a lot of uh, difficulties to patient and mortality and morbidity following management can be high. So it's a, a very important disease. And the first speaker today uh, is uh, Dr. Randima Nanayakara. He's actually a consultant oncological surgeon. He's attached to the North Colombo Teaching Hospital. Uh, and he was trained in National Cancer Institute and uh, UK. Uh, now Chandima will be speaking on the best no when not to operate, patient selection, and preoperative preparations for esophagectomy. Over to you, Chandima. Randima, sorry. Good afternoon. Thank you, College of Surgeons of Sri Lanka and the Sri Lanka Association of Surgical Oncologists for inviting me to do this talk. So, uh, good surgeons know how to operate. Better surgeons know when to operate and the best know when not to operate. It takes a lot of wisdom, courage and experience not to intervene. Therefore, patient selection and preoperative preparation for esophagectomy plays a very important role. Esophagectomy, as we all know, is a major complex surgical procedure historically associated with significant levels of morbidity and mortality. Um, the overall complication rate can be as high as 59%. Um, and in high volume centers, uh, 30 and 90 day mortality rates are 2.4 and 4.5%. Whereas for other centers, it can be as high as 5 and even 13% 30, 30 day mortality. There are many indications for esophagectomy. Uh, but the commonest is the carcinoma of the esophagus, high-grade dysplasia in Barrett's, chemical and caustic destruction of the esophagus, large leomyoma not amenable to any creation, end-stage achalasia, and, uh, benign, and uh, benign strictures not amenable to endotherapy are some of the indications for esophagectomy. However, terminally ill patients with limited life expectancy, those with uh, stage 4, CA carcinoma the esophagus, unresectable at uh, locally advanced disease due to uh, infiltration of the aorta bronchus, uh, that is T4B disease, extra regional lymph nodes spread to the mesenteric lymph nodes, uh, strictures uh, or tumors within uh, two centimeters of the upper esophageal sphincter, and uh, portal hypertension. These are some of the contraindications for esophagectomy. Um, Surgical uh, treatment of the esophagus, uh, es es esophageal carcinoma is quite complex. Uh, this involves uh, uh, operating in the neck, thorax, and in the abdomen. And there can be complications uh, in, in each of these stages. Um, and esophageal carcinoma uh, can easily invade adjacent structures and, and become surgically non-resectable. And additionally, because of the rich lymphatic supply in its submucosa, the, the lymphatic dissemination is an early event. And um, it can be, um, although it, it is about 5% in early tumors, T1 tumors, uh, it can be as high as 40% in T2, 60% uh, in T3, and 80% in T4 disease. Um, adding to the complexity of this is the gastroesophageal junctional tumors. Some uh, classify this as gastric, the others classify this as an esophageal cancer. However, uh, the surgical uh, management, uh, the goal of surgical management in uh, esophageal carcinoma is always curative. You do it, you do an esophagectomy with the curative intent. Um, and the surgical management is independent of the histology, histological variant. Um, so for esophageal carcinoma, uh, early, early cancer, that is uh, T1, T2 disease, is best managed with upfront um, esophagectomy if the patient is fit. Um, if the patient is having uh, locally advanced or nodal disease, they can be downstaged with preoperative chemo radiotherapy and then off offered uh, surgery subsequently. And for those with the cervical esophageal carcinoma or locally advanced uh, cancers that uh, are invading uh, structures like aorta, 
or the the bronchus or those who are unfit for surgery can be managed with uh, a definitive chemo radiotherapy or palliative treatment with stenting so the celiac mediastinal and the supraclavicular lymph nodes are now scored as regional lymph nodes according to the latest tnm staging regardless of the primary tumor location the number rather than the the location of the involved lymph nodes determines the uh, the end stage um there are certain uh, principles uh, in preoperative management of a patient with a, a carcinoma of the esophagus and this involves informed patient consent and motivation interdisciplinary risk assessment this should involve the anesthetist and uh, the the cardiologist the pulmonologist so it's a multidisciplinary approach uh, to the preoperative uh, prehabilitation in addition the nutritionist uh, 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 needs to get involved uh, in optimizing the patient's nutrition and uh, the eras program uh, they got together a team of international experts in the, in the surgical management of esophageal cancer and they uh, came up with several guidelines uh, for the perioperative care in esophageal cancer there have been uh, experts from various parts uh, of the world and they came up with 39 uh, uh, recommendations including um, procedure specific and non procedure specific uh, recommendations and there is strong recommendation for preoperative nutritional assessment and preoperative nutrition in intervention including tube feeding for those who are uh, uh, finding it difficult to follow and preoperative uh, oral pharmacognutrition this is an area um, which has recently uh, got a lot of uh, interest that is pharmacologically active nutrients including selenium uh zinc uh, then um, arginine ornithine and uh, glutamine uh, omega 3 fatty acids um there's a theory that supplementing these molecules may somehow influence the behavior of the immune system and um, in in favor of the critically ill patients uh prehabilitation prehabilitation programs particularly the chest physiotherapy uh, are also uh, uh, recommended Uh, then there are some operative recommendations including timing of surgery that is 3 to 6 weeks after new adjuvant chemotherapy and 6 to 10 weeks after new adjuvant chemo radiotherapy um whether it's a minimal uh, access or open technique um they both have uh, acceptable outcomes however the minimal access technique has shown to uh, uh, have added benefits such as less perioperative blood loss reduce the rate of pulmonary infections and shorter hospital stay the choice of conduit uh, there's a strong recommendation to always use a, 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 a simply a, a, simp, a, a simple tubularized gastric tube uh, pyloroplasty now they say there is no specific recommendation for this and there is no no evidence to support it lymphadenectomy a minimum of two field lymphadenectomy um, however for uh, squamous cell carcinoma of the mid thoracic Uh, a three field lymphadenectomy uh, uh, offers uh, a better survival advantage however it comes with additional um, morbidity uh, and may, may associate be associated with additional morbidity and complications such as recurrent angel nerve injury and higher uh, leak rates um so preoperative nutritional assessment um uh, there's been uh, if there's a significant weight loss prior to in, in the in the premorbid state uh, about about 10 to 15% a weight loss uh, body mass index less than 18 and low serum albumin levels are associated with adverse uh, outcomes and uh, poor uh, post uh, associated with the uh, operative post operative complications and those with severe dysphagia uh, tolerating only uh, fluids uh, they are also uh, they also fall into high risk category and um, then the preoperative pulmonary rehabilitation uh, pulmonary complications are a frequent morbidity event after esophagectomy the patient's age a uh, force expiratory volume within the first minute and the per performance status are independent uh, predictors of pulmonary complications there are several scoring systems uh, uh, to assess the patient's um, uh, pulmonary and cardiac uh, functions prior to this uh, surgery particularly esophagectomy and these in, uh, and these include uh, the asa uh, uh, classification of physical status kaplan uh, feinstein index adult comorbidity evaluation possum epas so many of these but the, the surgeon's gut feeling also plays a role particularly if the patient is experienced and has done several lists of agectomies so uh the surgical approach um 
Adenocarcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma involving the middle or the lower third of the esophagus generally requires a total esophagectomy. For uh, the, the gastroesophageal junctional tumors, a partial esophagectomy uh, uh, may, may be possible. However, the optimal surgical approach is unknown. And the choice of surgical approach depends on many factors, such as the tumor location, the length, submucosal extension, adherence to the surrounding structures, uh, then uh, the type and uh, the extent of lymphadenectomy desired, the conduit used, as well as the surgeon's preference. Mm, the lymph node status is an important prognostic parameter and an independent predictor of survival. Um, whether to do a two-field or a three-field lymphadenectomy, a minimum of two-field. However, for as I said earlier, the mid-thoracic esophagus may be combined with a, a three-field uh, esophagectomy. Transhiatal versus transthoracic. Um, no, uh, transhiatal uh, may be uh, uh, possible for gastroesophageal junctional tumors and those tumors at or below the level of uh, uh, the carina. However, transthoracic or uh, uh, a thoracoscopic procedure may be required for tumors located above the, the, the carina. Uh, squamous cell carcinoma versus adenocarcinoma. Uh, the, the, the esophagectomy, is, uh, the procedure is independent of the histology and generally uh, it's uh, decided by the, the the location of the tumor. Uh, no survival benefit in trans thoracic esophagectomy over trans esophagectomy for GOJ adenocarcinoma has been shown. CVAT1, CVAT2 uh, may be managed with a, a, a sub partial esophagectomy and an anastomosis in the thorax. Uh, in summary, uh, esophagectomy is a major complex procedure involving three regions of the body and it is best done by exper experts in a high volume center. Um, interdisciplinary risk assessments, preoperative planning, choice of procedure, these are all uh, important uh, in, uh, particular, uh, in, in reducing the patient's uh, morbidity and mortality. Preoperative staging, uh, uh, pulmonary prehabilitation and optimization of nutrition are also very important uh, prior to esophagectomy. It is, an, it is a teamwork. Um, uh, if it's done in several stages, a uh, couple of, uh, uh, at least two surgeons doing each stage separately can um, uh, greatly improve the patient's outcome. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Randima, for that excellent presentation, uh, really summarizing the cross of the matter.